Okay, let's get started with part two of this series of the Quadruped League. Uh, I'm quickly just here gonna explain to you uh, s uh, just really, really quickly and briefly some theory. So, uh, some of you might ask why we're not using the spring solver for the leg in the beginning. And the spring solver is a great tool to use a quadruped leg if you're doing something fast. But we're not trying to do something fast, we're trying to do something solid and something that we don't need to redo. Uh, the animators can animate with what we got right now, but we want to start with that simplicity because it's simple and because e an animator can use that, but they're going to lack some freedom if we start with a spring solver. And I'm going to explain to you right now. So. Let's try and see if we can get to draw something here. So I'm just going to draw it my, with my mouse. It's going to be fine. So a spring, this is essentially our leg, right? Uh, and in between this, there's a string, which is our IK handle. So if we to imagine just this. Actually, let's go back. Let's just quickly just try and uh, change some colors here. So let's try and take a red. Yeah, that's better. So if I go like that. Uh, let's see here, like that. That's our IK handle. So this is our IK handle. Uh, and the IK handle is a spring solver, which means that when we push this one up, we are going to get something that will be doing like this. And th that's not necessarily good, because our animators might want to be able to rotate this on their own, which is what we've done already. But sometimes they also want to have it automated. So in order to give them that freedom of like having both things, we're going to use only one joint in the whole spring solver rotation. Uh, rotation. So we are actually going to use the spring solver, but we're only going to use the rotation of uh, the lower joint here. So this one. So while, while this spring solver is moving up, we get a rotation value on, on this one. So in this case, the rotation value has gone from something like 90 to something about 45 degrees. And we kind of want to use this angle right here. And we want to use that angle in our in our lower leg controller. Because our controller is already... Con we have a controller that's called the ball roll controller that's controlling this part right here already in our setup. If we can automate that rotate by adding this rotation into the orient group of that controller, we can take we can blend between the um, we can blend between choosing the rotation of this joint, or we can uh, use nothing at all. And let's uh, just get into Maya and like see how we do that. Okay, so here we are back in Maya, and we'll now try and apply some of the. Simple theory that we just uh, covered uh, in the previous introduction to this second part. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up my outliner and I'm going to duplicate the uh, leg that we just added all this stuff to, and you can see like it's duplicated here. So even though it's lying right on top, it's still here. So it's still keeping some of all this stuff, but since it's a duplicate, these things, these effectors coming from the uh, IK handles are, have no longer any effect on our joints. So I'm just going to kill those and I'm going to select all of them. Or the root, it doesn't really matter. And we just need to rename those quickly so we, we don't get confused. So I'm going to just say uh, JNT. Actually, let's say underscore JNT. And let's say... Uh, let's just say spring. And let's use a capital. And then JNT. Spring JNT. Right, so that's added to our naming. I'm just going to move that one, so because now they're not sharing the same name anymore. Um, okay, and since the spring chain is only consistent of, or in this case, only will be consistent of four joints, I'm just going to delete the end joint here, and that will be our spring joint. So I'm just going to select all of them, like so, and I'm just going to take the radius, and if I hold our control while middle mouse clicking, I can I can use the radio on my joints. It's not scaling them, it's just a visual representation of my joints being expanded, so now I can see my original chain and my spring chain. Uh, separate a little bit better. So now, for some of you, if you go into skeleton and you say IK handle, you'll see sing. Oh, that's great. So it's the same for me this time. So you'll see single chain and rotate plane solver. And we need our spring solver to be loaded. <coughs> There's a various ways of doing that, and we're going to do it the easy way. So we're just going to write. Uh, I think it's IK IK spring solver. Okay, no, but items were selected. Okay, I might need to look this one up though. 
Uh, so let's see if that actually did something for me. So you can see just by writing that mail code IK. So I'm just going to write that one more time if you guys didn't see it. You can go back, but IK small, the capital S spring, capital S for solver, and then enter after that. And then if you look into your menu now, you'll have the IK spring solver option here. I'm just going to switch it, switch it to that, and I'm going to select my first joint and my last joint. And then I have my IK spring solver. And an IK spring solver works exactly like an IK rotate plane solver. Uh, when it comes to um, pole vectors, so I'm just immediately going to select my pole vector here because we already made one and we can use the same. I'm uh, going to call that and uh, constrain that to my IK pole vector as a pole vector. So you can see that's activated now. And if I move around, you can see they don't exactly move the same, but that doesn't matter since we're still only going to skin to our first chain here, the smaller one. Uh, so what did we talk about in a theory? We talked about that we, when we move this foot up and down, so if I first of all take my IK spring solver and just parent it underneath my handle, so when I move it up and down, you can see it's moving. So what do I really want from this? I The reason why we didn't want the IK spring solver alone is because it's actually bending all the all the joints here. And in most cases, animators want this freedom to be able to go in and do this, and you cannot do that with a spring solver. So we need to get that freedom of automated rotation plugged into this controller, and that's what we're going to do now. So when I move this foot up here, like so, I'm getting a rotation angle, and I get the rotation angle of 36 here. If I go down, I have a rotation angle of 0 which is great because I can use that rotation angle to put into this controller's orient or modify, modify group. We already have one here, but I could use the, I could either create a new group or I can just use the orient group. In this case I'm just going to use the orient group. So I want that rotation that I get here from this one. So let's try and lift this one up and make sure that this is, this is bending backwards. That's alright. So let's see, that's a minus 28 rotation. Okay, so Let's see if we can get something from that. So I'm just going to reset everything here. And we put that rotation in here just to test. So the first thing I'm going to do now is say, let's see if we already got that actually. No, we didn't. That's great. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say auto rotate, rotate ball. And I'm just going to give it a value from 0 to 1. Because we want like, uh, and it's going to be a float because I want to float between not having it and having it on so it's not only going to be an animation from one frame to another we can actually animate it to be a little bit we can choose the amount of percentage of influence so here you go after calling that the name and giving it as a keyable and setting it as a float everything will be standard if you just go to help oh sorry if you just go into the add attribute it should be like that for standard and then your minimum zero maximum one so that's here, minimum 0, maximum 1. So now I want to take my controller here and I want to go into my node editor. And inside my node editor, I want to take this rotate this rotation value and I want to use that uh, for a switch. Now which node in Maya can you use for switching between two attributes? Let's try with the color node. Blend colors. So what's cool about blend color node is this blender chooses between either using these three or these three channels. Channels. So if I put it on one, I actually think the blend color node is a little bit ridiculous because it's uh, it seems a little bit opposite. So if I try to, uh, I'll, you'll see that in a second, anyways. But the blender will control if we're either using the first channel or the second channel. So let's try and just call this one L. Hilek hind and auto roll ball anything like that and then BLND for blend color. So I already created my on offs my blender because I want to go from either zero influence or to the in active influence of this rotation. So the first thing I'm going to do is easy. I'm just going to take this 
auto roller, and I'm going to put that into my blender because that's the one that's going to be blending either between having zero value or having the value of our joint. And we're going to put the rotation value of the joint in here. So we're going to take this joint here, and I'm just going to hit the plus sign here. And you can see I'm getting my joint here. And once again, I hold down control, drag and drop it onto this with the middle mouse click. And here, I only want to get my rotation values, and I remember that we rotate it in set. So we're going to put the rotation of set into our blend color 1R. And we can see inside the blend color 1R that it's connected here. So if I lift my foot up now, the result of that rotation is minus 28. And that's the result we get from this, from our spring, the bottom of our spring. So now, the next thing I want to do is take the output of this one and put that into my controller. But since my controller is already occupied by me needing that rotation channel, for the ball roll obviously, we're going to put it into the orientation group. And if we didn't have that orientation group, in case that you ended up with some rotations, if you use the parent constraint input instead of a point constraint, you can just create another group, duplicate your modify group, like if I did like this, and I just put that underneath here, delete this. So now they're both underneath my modify group. I could call this auto rotate. And then I can parent my control underneath that. And now I actually have a group in a, in the same spot that I can use with it, instead of using my own group. I like to have my own groups clean, so let's just use this now for now. So now I have the auto rotate group. So let's try and add some auto rotate to it. So here's the group. Once again, I'm going to put it here. Drag and drop this blend node. And this time I want to see the non keyable because an output channel is a non keyable channel. I'm going to take this one put it into my rotate. As far as I remember, the rotate channel I want to use is X in this case, because we want to rotate that way. So let's try and put the output of this one, output R, into the rotate channel R. Let's see, we have zero, so that's perfect. What happens if we lift our leg now? Bam. So we get the rotation from this one, 31. We get that rotation into our auto rotator, but it's not rotating. So why is that? Well, maybe it's because our blender is not yet put on. So if I put it to 1, and I select the orange, you can see this, and I select the rotate group, I get that rotation in here, which means that my foot roll is now being affected by the spring. Now that's really sweet, but the best thing about this is that I can choose to use it or not use it, depending on the animation shot. And that's how you upgrade your foot. To be a little bit more advanced, but as you can see, you don't need this upgrade in order for the animators to work, because they can still, if you give them something, they can work with it like this, and once they update their reference, when you make that update with your auto rotate, they can just hook it on and they don't lose animation or anything, they'll just have a nice update for the next animation. Or they can choose to blend it on while they're animating. Just make sure that when you release your rig, that this wasn't uh, this one might should might be in zero, so all the animation won't look funky. So that's the upgrade of the foot right now, and if you uh, know, I'm just gonna continue for a little bit because we're only on 11 minutes and I kinda wanna keep them around half an hour. Uh, but that's definitely like where you can take that. So now you know how to make the quadruped leg. Uh, a very solid one. You, you have a lot of freedom with this. So the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to finalize it. Uh, for some of you who don't need to watch anymore, if you know how to continue from here, you can definitely just shut off. I'm just going to continue so the ones who are a little bit insecure uh, can learn something new. So, first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to kill. I'm going to select all these channels that I'm I'm not planning on using. Doesn't matter if I. I'm just going to select these, use these. Visibility. I'm not going to hook it off any, any time. And then I'm going to right click and I'm going to say lock and hide. We don't need that. Uh, I, I'm going to keep these in here just in case. The next thing I'm going to do is with my foot control. 
Gonna select the scale, we don't need that, we don't need to, to hook off the visibility either. I'm gonna lock and hide that as well. So now I'm gonna show you a quick trick. And the trick is to audio your channels, because right now this can seem a little bit confusing. So one thing that we can do is say edit, add attribute, and we can say foot adders. And we're just gonna make that displayable. So the problem right now, because I want to separate my regular channels with my ad my personalized attributes, the problem is that every time you add an attribute, it's going to end up in the bottom. And that's not what we want. We want them to separate each other from the channel. Now the cool thing about Maya is that we can actually just delete these channels. So if I hit delete attributes, now they're gone. But if I undo that action, they actually end up underneath my attribute here, which is weird because in theory it should really go back and do the whole stack the right way, but mine doesn't work that way, so we're just going to use that to our advantage. And in this case, I just actually, <laughs> and now I actually undid an attribute again, so now I'm just going to do one more time. So I'm going to delete the attributes and then undo that. Now, let's select our foot again. I'm just going to right click on this one and I'm going to say lock it, just so we have a color difference as well. So there's not there's no harming having this attribute, but it makes it easy for the animators to see if there are any extra attributes on this. And in this case there is, so they can see that. Very simple stuff. And we're going to select the pole vector. And on a pole vector you only need the translation, because it doesn't matter like how you rotate this. So we're just going to kill those things as well. Next thing we're going to do is there's a lot of ways of rigging, and which is why some people are going to say, "Oh, this is this, this is a different way that I'm, I've seen it before. I, I like to have it this way." Some people would say they want something different, and that's all fine. Good animators will find a way to make a rig work for them instead of expecting the same rig to be the same every place they go. And but no matter where you go as a rigger, you'll always meet those animators who just can't work unless they get exactly what they're used to. I've been a couple of places, and that's definitely the case everywhere. But since there's so many ways of rigging, you should just focus on doing it the way that your soup is telling you or that you feel very comfortable about doing it. Obviously if your soup tells you to do something then you probably should get, get your head around that. So the next thing I'm going to do now is that there's going to be something called color coding. And color coding is really important because sometimes when your character is moving around and your animator is going crazy and really going to town, moving everything around, some of the controllers can get quite mixed up with each other everywhere like if I put this foot forward and this foot is backward the controllers can suddenly be crossed and specifically like there are pole vectors which are not staying inside a specific limb can get like a little bit lost so it's it's a good idea to first of all color your controls and second of all give them different shapes so the first thing I'm gonna do here is just select this pole vector and I'm just gonna select so and under, there's no rules for this you can do whatever you want and I'm just gonna stress now normally I would never sit and spend time on correcting my shapes more than once and usually I would pick up a script online and do that and I definitely suggest you guys do it as well because you can spend hours on making nice and perfectly pretty shapes but at the end of the day you want something that's just easy and intuitive for the animators to pick up and it's there's a lot of good scripts online Creative Crash have like tons of really good ones that where you can pick up shapes and I'm that I'm just gonna show you right now how to create a shape on your own and then how I'm gonna get that into my uh, into my character so um, I'm just gonna go in here and then I'm gonna say create CB curve tool I'm gonna hold down my actually we, the easiest probably way because we're gonna try and make a cube so the easiest way here and I want it to be one big continuous shape, so I can't just like select all the edges and go up to modify and say convert them to edges, because that will, that that won't work the same way. So I'm gonna go here and say create. I'm gonna CV t CV tool, and I'm gonna go into my tools uh, tools settings, and I'm gonna make sure that it's on one linear. Now I'm gonna hold down V, and I'm gonna snap it to all these edges. And it doesn't matter if you overlap more than once, that's totally fine. The only thing you should focus on is not making crosses or anything, at least if you want to hit the same shape as mine. There's no rules, but just to keep that clean, I'm trying to like sort of get the feel if I got them all now. I think I have them all now. So now I'm just going to select the cube, and hit the lead on that, 
And of course I hit something wrong here. A good old rookie mistake. Okay, so we're just gonna quick kill that kill that one. I'm just gonna hold down shift and right click and then drag down to polycube and you can see Maya don't need to track that so if I do like this it's gonna come on its own so fairly fast process so let's just try and do that one more time. So hold down V or V go. Oops. Keep on I can just undo there, that's fine. Go down, around and I think that's it. So I'm just gonna select that cube. Yeah, now we got a good shape. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna scale that up so you guys can see what's going on. I'm gonna freeze it so everything is zeroed on it. We don't really need that, but it's a good thing to do because now our underlying shape, which is the one here. So as you know, now all shapes in Maya have a transform node, which is what your animators are keying on. So technically, we only want to get that shape switched out with with this shape. But the first thing I'm going to do now is to select this one. You can see it's when I'm inside the viewport, a shape doesn't have a specific point that's selectable in the viewport, but the transform node does. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do here is to select the, the cube. I'm going to duplicate it just to make sure I have one extra So for when I'm done doing the first process. So I'm going to select the first... Let's try and hide this one. So I'm going to select the first cube. I'm going to select the shape first, and then I'm going to select the the transform group of my controller. So you can see the same thing for this one. Here's the shape. And now I have the shape of this one and the transform node of my controller. And it's important you get those correct. Shape first, transform node afterwards. I'm going to go down to the melt tab and I'm going to write parent minus R minus S. So minus for relative, which means that I'm going to move, the spa move these pieces into the object space of this controller and S is that I'm taking the shape. So if I hit enter now, you can see that this controller ended up here. Now check out what happens if I select my old controller now. It's actually selecting both the shapes, because they're now becoming one. So because I don't want that circle anymore, I'm just going to take the name of that. You don't really need to do that, but it's always good to have some stuff clean, so I like to do that. So I kill it now, now that I got the shape copied, I kill it, and then I paste it into my new shape, and then I hit F8 to try and, well, somehow make this an intuitive shape. I'm not going to spend too much time on shaping curves because we got other stuff to do. And we're coming on 20 minutes soon. So I'm just going to finish off this one. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my other curve here. I'm going to unhide it. I'm going to select my uh, heel control. So you can see I got the, you can see on the icon here, I got the transform node. And you can see here I got my shape node. So shape node first, transform node. And then I go down here to the mill tab. I can push a uh, pick walk up. So that's arrow up. I'm going to get the old mill command that I used first. It's going to do the same thing. So because they have the same orientation. But you can see here. This is the new shape for that. And I'm going to go in and take the name. Of my ball. I'm going to kill that. And I'm going to paste that name into this shape. Then I'm going to reshape it so we have something that looks good. And obviously we don't want something that's exactly like our foot control. And obviously all these shapes are completely personal preferences, like whatever you want to have. It's up to you guys. So now I'm feeling pretty good about that. That should be okay. So you can see here, if I do like that, that looks good. If I hit on the outer roll, you can see how that's moving for me now. And it's doing all the work for me. So that's great. That's really good. And then, let's continue. So to finish off, there's a rule about, now we got our shapes and that's great. So the last thing I want to make sure is that we have our color correction done correctly. And I'm going to stress right now, if you decide to go with a rig that has all the advanced controls, I can do squash and stretch and auto rotate and all that crap. If you don't color correct your controls, no one will hire you. Cause at the end of the day, you can have all the control you want in the world, but if nobody can figure out how to use it because it's not intuitive, nobody nobody is gonna and nobody nobody wants to hire somebody who ignores the simplicity. Or at least at least it would be a rookie mistake to do.
So make sure that your color co control is correct now. And I'm going to show you how to color right now. So I'm selecting my controller here, and it's important that I don't color my uh, um, my transform node. Because if you color a transform node, it means that everything that's underneath this hierarchy is going to get the same color. Just as if you parent something underneath a underneath a transform node and you move that around, the children will always follow. So we're going to try and take something that doesn't have children, and that's the shape. So we only make sure to color the shape. So I'm selecting the shape here, and I'm going to go down to my object display, and I'm checking here, okay, this is my shape, and I can double check that it's a nerves curve. And you can always check that your nerves curve is going to be a shape, and the transform node of that is going to be, well, let's see here. So it's still going to give me like the name of the nerves curves, because that's what we're looking at inside the attribute editor, but really this is the one that I have selected. And you can see that's a transform node, the one that our animator is going to work with. So I'm going to go down to the shape, I'm going to go down to object display, drawing overrides, I'm going to enable the overrides, and now I can pick a color. And what color should you pick? So you can pick a green, it's not too clever since whatever you select in the viewport is also green, so every time you have something selected you could also mistakenly think that this controller is a selection. So let's try and go with something that's a little smarter. And usually where I've been, there's a couple of rules, but there's not really like any anything that goes completely through everywhere. Most of the time, a lot of people will use blue for the left side, but definitely red for the right side, because R for red, R for right, just some intuitive stuff. Think about what you what you think is logical and just go with that. So I'm just going to pick some, we're in the left side right now, so I'm going to pick the blue one. Let's see if we can find that. There we go. I want like a really strong blue one, because this is my main controllers. So let's pick that one, and let's do the same for this one. Since the shapes are different, we're differentiating them by using different shapes. We could we could go in and make this one like uh, some sort of like different blue. I wouldn't think of it as super necessary in this case because they're very different shapes, and they will never overlap more than this, right? So there's not really any point in in making it too hard. I'm going to do the same thing for this one. But really, there's no rules for colors. Just making sure which shape I hit there. It was the shape. Great. And I think uh, that's the end of the quadruped leg. And later on, we're gonna. I'm just gonna for now actually. I'm gonna parent everything in the same group. Uh, group, and I'm gonna call that L leg hind group. And let's yeah, let's call it that for now. And congratulations, you finished your uh, your first hind leg group. Uh, first leg hind leg. Uh, of to put leg as well, yeah. So this goes for both back and front legs. Uh, so now you can go on and just create all of your other legs. Um, I, this is it's not an easy process. I know that. If you have any questions, you can throw me a mail and you can ask in the comments. It's good to ask in the comments because then other people might be able to read how you've been dealing with your errors. Uh, I'll see if how many of you I can reply. If any anybody has any questions, sometimes it's it's still quite new, like uh, my tutorials. So sometimes people are well shy and not really <laughs> asking anything. That's totally fine. That's great. Uh, but yeah, hit me up if you got any questions, and I'll I'll look into it. And we're gonna continue next time. Will probably be let's see the spine or the tail. I haven't decided yet. I'll see. Um, anyways, good luck and uh, keep me posted. Okay, so congratulations if you made it this far. You're at the final part of uh, final final destination of uh, module one. Module one, which was the legs, and we're quickly gonna do something that we call um, lessons learned, where we're gonna. It's a kind of reflection of what we've learned, where we struggled, how. Normally, we would also talk about how what we can do better. So let's quickly just run over some of the things here. Uh, the first thing we talked about was uh, pivot points. We learned that even though some anatomy on a monster, we have to sort of create our own anatomy. Uh, it's a good idea to find reference, uh, and I'm inviting you guys to do that. Uh, I can't show everything in these videos since they're going to be too long, but obviously there's some there's some uh, anatomy that that I'm thinking about, and and I think like it's important that we try to be as realistic as we can, but also like make it work for for our rig uh 
Uh, we took the leg and made it from basic to intermediate. We uh, applied uh, a normal uh, foot controller uh, to begin with, and then we upgraded that into an intermediate leg uh, with the spring solver, where we used the rotation of the spring solver to rotate our, our ball roll. Uh, we also added foot rolls, and always like when you do something like foot rolls, there's always tons of stuff that you can add to your to your to your foot. So in this case, we just used a very basic like the ball, the pivot. Uh, but what you could do also is add side rolls, for instance. So you can add like pivoting rolls, so he can pivot from the front of his foot instead of uh, from only the controller. And you can pivot from just like you do with the heel, you can do that with the front. Um, so. That's basically what we learned, and and I, th I think what what you guys should do now is set yourself some goals, and I think those goals should be uh, thinking about what you, what I've been doing, and then try and replicate it yourself into making into fighting a character and doing it on that character's four legs. There are certain ways that I've talked as I've talked about before, where you can duplicate the leg setup that we've already done and put it into uh, well duplicated with an input with what we call an input graph uh, but I think it's important that you guys uh, try and replicate uh, the whole thing uh, on your own because that's when you're gonna learn the actual how it actually works instead of just sit, sitting and watching it's easy to say oh I understand it now but once you're sitting with it it doesn't really make sense you need to go out and try and do it and remembering that struggling is good because if you're struggling then that means that you're learning and if you if you're still learning this setup when you're sitting and doing it it means that you you're not totally sure about it yet so remember like when you're sitting there and thinking like oh where did you put it through it's okay to go back into the videos and watch it again and run over it one more time and i think what i'm trying to say here is that i want you guys to understand like the why over the how you need to demystify the process of making any kind of rig because if you demystify it and you understand the basics of it you can implement that into other rigs and other setups and you'll start to see patterns in the way that you're rigging anyways this was the first part uh, of the of the series of creating a quadruped and uh, you've now completed the leg module uh, videos uh, and I hope that you're gonna continue to the spine which is next so uh, very well done guys